Mendelian genetics, the laws of segregation, and independent assortment, and terms such as genotype, and phenotype were already introduced to you, in the video discussion on overview of heredity topics. In this video lesson on Mendelian inheritance, we will be delving deeper into the four postulates whom Mendel formulated, which characterize Mendelian inheritance. We will also elaborate, on the significance of understanding, the law of independent assortment, as we try to predict phenotypic ratios, in a dihybrid cross. Lastly, we will apply the laws of probability, using a much simpler method, known as the fork line diagram, to solve dihybrid and trihybrid crosses. It was Mendel who formulated these four postulates, which became the foundation for Mendelian inheritance. These postulates include, unit factors in pairs, dominance versus recessiveness, segregation, and independent assortment, what do these postulates, mean? How important are these, in understanding the most basic pattern of inheritance? Let us now take a look at, how Mendel defined the postulates he formulated. Mendel's first postulate, that unit factors occur in pairs, states that, genetic characters, are controlled by unit factors, existing in pairs, in individual organisms. I suppose that this statement, is already familiar to you. Recall from the video lesson, on overview of heredity topics, how we defined what a character is. As what was stated, characters are controlled by unit factors. Do you now have an idea what a unit factor is, based on what you have learned in the previous video lessons? Mendel was referring to genes when he thought of unit factors at that time. Mendel even said that these unit factors, exist in pairs. What do you call, the alternative forms of a gene again? At this point, it is very important that you have gained sufficient understanding, of the relationships among character, traits, genes, and alleles, before proceeding to the next topics in this video lesson. If you are still confused, pause this video for a while, and watch the video lesson on overview of heredity topics again. Let us proceed to Mendel's second postulate, on the dominance of a trait, over a recessive one. It states that, when two unlike unit factors responsible for a single character are present in a single individual, one unit factor is dominant to the other, which is said to be recessive. It means that in a heterozygous individual, which has both dominant and recessive alleles for a certain character, the dominant trait is always expressed. In Mendelian genetics, the dominant trait is always expressed as phenotype, in heterozygous individuals. However, we cannot expect the same trend in other inheritance patterns, labeled as non-Mendelian inheritance. In some cases, there is incomplete dominance, such that the resulting phenotype is somewhat a mixing or combination of two traits. In other cases such as codominance, both traits will be expressed in a heterozygous individual. You will know more about incomplete dominance and codominance in a separate video discussion on non-Mendelian inheritance. Next, Mendel's third postulate, talks about the segregation of unit factors, during gamete formation. It states that, during the formation of gametes, the paired unit factors separate, or segregate, randomly so that each gamete receives one, or the other with equal likelihood. The concept of segregation have been explained to you extensively in the video lesson on meiosis, so we will not be dwelling on this topic any longer. Let us now proceed to Mendel fourth postulate, on independent assortment, which states that, during gamete formation, segregating pair of unit factors assort independently of each other. The law of independent assortment will be further explained when we arrive at solving dihybrid and trihybrid crosses. Since the laws of segregation, and independent assortment are in conjunction with each other, a good understanding of the law of segregation, will be of advantage to you, to better comprehend what independent assortment is all about. How did Mendel arrive at formulating those four postulates? He did a series of experiments, on garden pea plant. He took note of the seven characters of garden pea plant, such as seed shape, seed color, pod shape, 
pod color, flower color, flower position, and stem height. He also took note of the two contrasting traits, for each character. He was able to determine which between the two contrasting traits, is dominant, and which trait is recessive, after examining the results of monohybrid crosses he conducted. Let us now explore how to predict genotypic, and phenotypic ratios, in a monohybrid cross. But what is a monohybrid cross, by the way? A monohybrid cross, involves only one pair of contrasting traits. In our first example, we will try to predict the genotypic and phenotypic ratios, of the offsprings of a cross, between two parents, which are heterozygous for the tall trait. In this monohybrid cross, suppose that two parents, which are both heterozygous for the tall trait, were mated. Keep in mind that a heterozygous individual, has a copy of both dominant and recessive alleles. Since the allele that codes for the tall trait is dominant, over that of the dwarf trait, the tall trait was expressed as the phenotype of this plant. Let us now try to predict the genotypic, and phenotypic ratios, of the outcomes of this mating. First, we have to identify the gametes, that will participate in the mating. We will be applying the law of segregation, in determining what specific allele, each gamete will be receiving, from the parent. During gamete formation, the allele for the tall trait, and the allele for the dwarf trait, will separate from each other, and will land on two different gametes. The same is true for the other parent. The next step is to make a grid, with four squares. This is called a panette square. and then, place the gametes of paternal origin, on the left side of the table, and the gametes from maternal source, on top of the table. The positioning of paternal and maternal gametes may vary. It's up to you which between the left, or top sides of the table, will you place the gametes. The squares represent the possible genetic combinations, once the paternal and maternal gametes unite, during fertilization. The next thing to do now, is to fill up the squares. Let us start filling up this square, to show the resulting genetic combination, if a paternal gamete, carrying the dominant allele, unites with a maternal gamete, also carrying a dominant allele. We expect that the resulting offspring, will be homozygous dominant, for the tall trait. Let us now do the same thing, for this square. In this case, the paternal gamete carries a recessive allele, while the maternal gamete carries a dominant allele. What do you think, is the genotype and phenotype, of the resulting offspring? The resulting offspring will be heterozygous, but the tall trait, will still be expressed as the phenotype. Now that the panette square has been filled up, let us try to summarize the possible genetic combinations, from a cross of two parents, heterozygous for the tall trait. Three different genotypes are possible, from the given cross. These are the following. The genotypic ratio for the given cross is 1 is to 2 is to 1. It means that from a cross of two parents, heterozygous for the tall trait, we can predict that there is a 1, out of 4 chance, that the resulting offspring will be homozygous dominant, 2 out of 4 chances, that the offspring will be heterozygous, and 1 out of 4 chance, that the outcome will be homozygous recessive. What if we consider the possible phenotypes, from the given cross? Since a resulting offspring, which could either be homozygous dominant, or heterozygous dominant, will express the tall trait, we add up these probabilities, to predict the chance of having a tall offspring, from a cross of two parents, heterozygous for the tall trait. Hence, there are three out of four chances, that the resulting offspring will be tall. And there is one out four chance, that the resulting offspring will be dwarf. Thus, 
the phenotypic ratio will be 3 is to 1. Now, it's time for your practice. Try to solve a monohybrid cross between tall and dwarf parents. Provide answers to the shapes with question marks on them. Pause this video for a while, when you are answering. Resume playing the video, once you've finished answering. Now, check if you got the correct answers. If you got most, if not all correct answers, congratulations. You may now proceed to the next topic, on dihybrid cross. If you still have difficulty solving a monohybrid cross, then practice more, before proceeding to the next topics in the video. Mendel also did experiments on dihybrid crosses, which involve two characters at a time. In this example, we will try to predict the possible genotypes, and phenotypes of the resulting offsprings, from a cross made between parents, which produce yellow and round seeds. Why is the mating between these two parental strains, considered as a dihybrid cross? The answer is, two characters are involved in this mating. These are seed color, and seed shape. For seed color, the contrasting traits are yellow, and green. Yellow seed color, is dominant over green. While for seed shape, the contrasting traits are round, and wrinkled. Round seed shape, is dominant over wrinkled shape. Take note that, regardless of the shape, the dominant yellow color, will always be expressed, over the green seed color. The same thing is true for seed shape. The dominant round shape will always be expressed over the wrinkled trait, regardless whether the seeds were colored yellow, or green. Think about this illustration for a while, for it will help you understand, the law of independent assortment better. Now, let us take a look at the genotypes, of the parental strains. We can see here that both parents, are heterozygous for seed color, and seed shape. Again, the first step in solving whether a monohybrid, or dihybrid cross, is the identification of the gametes that would possibly participate, in the process of fertilization. But, how do we know how many gametes, could be formed from one parent? Here is a useful table for determining, how many gametes, genotypic and phenotypic combinations could possibly form from a given cross, based on the number of heterozygous gene pairs, of a parent which is participating in the cross. Hence, this genotype contains, 1, 2, heterozygous gene pairs. We can see in the table, that for every two heterozygous gene pairs present, four different types of gametes, could be produced. Now that we already know, that four different gametes, could be formed from this parent, it's now time to identify the combination of alleles, that each gamete will be receiving, during gamete formation. In this case, we need to apply the laws of segregation, and independent assortment. To make the process more simple, let us treat seed color, and seed shape separately. Let us focus on seed color first. Following the law of segregation, the two alleles will separate from each other, and each gamete will have equal likelihood, of receiving either the dominant, or the recessive allele. Since four gametes will be produced, two of these, will be receiving the dominant allele, while the other two, will receive the recessive allele. This time, let us consider the seed shape. Again, following the law of segregation, the two alleles will separate from each other, and each gamete will have equal likelihood, of receiving either the dominant, or the recessive allele. Take a look at the resulting combinations. Are these correct? Remember that four different gametes, should be produced. But this one, and this one are identical. Same with the other two. Meaning to say, we only have two gametes formed. We need to redistribute the alleles for seed shape, to form four different gametes.
Now, take a look at the resulting combinations. Are these correct? Do we now have four different gametes? How is independent assortment applicable, in the distribution of alleles for both seed color and seed shape, among the gametes formed? Based on the resulting gametes, the presence of a dominant allele for seed color, will not influence or dictate which allele that controls seed shape, will it accompany in the same gamete. The same thing is true for the recessive allele for seed color. Its presence in a gamete will not affect which seed shape allele, it will accompany. We have successfully identified, the different gametes that could be formed from one parent. How about for the other one? Since it has the same genotype as the other parent, it will produce the same set of gametes. The next step in solving a dihybrid cross, is to make a panet square, this time made of 16 squares. You may ask, why 16 squares? That's because we are trying to determine, the genotype and phenotype of a resulting offspring, when a paternal and maternal gamete unite during fertilization. Since four gametes of maternal origin, and four gametes of paternal origin, could possibly participate during fertilization, we take into account all the possible genetic combinations that might be formed. After dividing the table into 16 squares, place the gametes along the left, and top sides of the grid. Pause this video for a while, then try to determine the genotype for each square. Resume on playing this video once you've finished answering. Now, try to check if your answers are correct. This time, determine the corresponding phenotype, for each square. What is the phenotype of the offspring which is homozygous dominant for both characters? The answer is yellow and round. How about this one? This. And this. How about these? Seems quite easy. Let us go on with this. And this. How about this? This. And lastly, this one. If you got all the phenotypes correctly, congratulations. Now, let us try to determine number of different phenotypes, from the given cross. The denominator 16, pertains to the total number of possible offsprings, that could be produced. Let us count how many seeds have yellow color and round shape. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, seeds. Hence, there are 9 out of 16 chances, that a resulting offspring from a cross between two parents, producing yellow and round seeds, will also bear yellow and round seeds. How about those with yellow and wrinkled seeds? There are 1, 2, 3, seeds. So that's 3 out of 16 chances. How many will have green and round seeds? There are 1, 2, 3, seeds. So, that's also 3 out of 16 chances. Lastly, how many will have green and wrinkled seeds? There is only one. Thus, there's only one out of 16 chance. That's a very rare phenomenon then. What if we try to make a trihybrid cross? And we have chosen these three characters, flower color, flower position, and stem height, with their corresponding contrasting traits. How do we solve a trihybrid cross? Suppose a tall plant, with violet flowers, located along its sides, was crossed with a dwarf plant, with white flowers, on its terminal end. Since one parent, is homozygous dominant for all the traits, while the other parent is homozygous recessive, for all the traits, the resulting offspring will also be tall, and will have violet flowers, located along its sides. The resulting offspring, however, is heterozygous for all the three characters. 
what will be the phenotypes, of the resulting offsprings, from a cross made between two members of the F1 generation. In solving a tri-hybrid cross, construction of a punet square would seem too time-consuming, cumbersome, and messy. Could you just imagine how long it will take you to fill up a table with 64 squares? Why is it 64 squares this time? Do you still remember the formula we used, to determine the number of different gametes, that could be produced from each parent, that will be participating in a cross? Since both parents are heterozygous, for all characters, each parent will be producing 8 different gametes. So 8 times 8, is equal to 64. Anyway, we will not go through that elaborate procedure anymore. There is an easier method that you can use, to predict genotypic and phenotypic ratios, of offsprings resulting from a tri-hybrid cross. This method is called as fork line diagram. Before you could successfully construct a fork line diagram, your knowledge of independent assortment, and product law of probability, are important prerequisites. Let us now define the product law. When two independent events occur simultaneously, the probability of the two outcomes, occurring in combination, is equal to the product of their individual probabilities of occurrence. Let us now apply the product law, by making three separate panet squares. One for each character. One for flower color, one for flower position, and another one for stem height. For example, we are interested only in finding out the phenotypic ratio, for each cross. The following are the phenotypic ratio for each cross. The next thing to do, is to place the phenotypic probabilities for each character, in this manner. Of course, the sequence of placing the phenotypic probabilities won't matter. Whether you begin with stem height, or flower position, the end result will be the same. And draw lines connecting the phenotypic probabilities for one character, to those of the other character, and so on. Based on its general appearance, do you now have an idea, why it is called fork line diagram? Now that the individual probabilities of each cross have been plotted, the next step is to multiply the individual probabilities, connected by a line. To illustrate, we will multiply the probability of the occurrence of violet colored flowers, with the probability of occurrence of axially positioned flowers, and with the probability of having tall plants among the progeny. So, that's 3 fourths, times 3 fourths, times 3 fourths, which is equal to 27 out of 64 chances that the resulting offspring from the given cross will be a tall plant, with violet flowers, axially positioned. Now, let us do the same, with the succeeding branch. So we multiply 3 fourths, by 3 fourths, by 1 fourth, which is equal to 9 out of 64. Hence, there are 9 out of 64 chances, that the resulting offspring from the given cross will be a dwarf plant, with violet flowers, which are axially positioned. Pause this video for a while, and do the same for the remaining branches. Resume playing the video once you've finished answering. Thank you for watching.